how and why did I start taking aerial photographs? Um, you know, my original impetus to fly at all was mainly to see, <laughs> see the world from above. And because that's also the primary impetus behind taking photographs, there was a very early um, synergy between my flying activities and my picture making. Even though I didn't get serious about taking photographs from the air until somewhat later in my career, um, the, the primary motivation was there pretty much from the start. At first, uh, on my very early flights when I was 14, 15 years old, I was so consumed and absorbed with the primary experience of simply seeing the world that way that it really didn't cross my mind to think about photographing it. And there were a number of years of that kind of absorption um, that went on before I felt saturated enough to begin thinking about rendering <laughs> the experience in another form. And uh, that happened when I started flying uh, for a living when I began flight instructing. So my career path was to um, go into professional pilot training and get all the licenses necessary to actually earn a living as a pilot. And at the time, the, the path that I chose was to be a flight instructor. And so as a full-time professional flight instructor, Every day, I went out with um, a whole variety of students and uh, taught them to fly, already, either as primary students or advanced students working on commercial multi-engine instrument ratings. But in any case, I was in the sky pretty much all day long with various students, and I began carrying my camera with me on those instructional flights. Um, very low key, and I would always talk to my students about it, that I was carrying my camera and it was kind of a hobby of mine too. If we just happened to see something interesting or beautiful out the window that I would just pull my camera out and snap. And uh, that's how I started. And eventually my flying turned into a little bit more uh, of having more charter flying activity where I was flying paying passengers on uh, trips to various destinations in addition to my students. And on those flights, those charter flights, uh, occasionally I would have trips where uh, one of the legs on the flight was empty. And that's when I began to kind of cut my teeth on getting more serious with the technical challenges of making a good photograph from the air. And that continued on during the other changes in my life that uh, resulted in my moving to the American Southwest and, and living out here on the Navajo Reservation. And it was a similar scenario in which some of my flights for the tribal government had legs that were empty. And that gave me a sense of freedom to begin experimenting more, pushing the limits a little more, and it was a very uh, iterative kind of process where the more I took photographs in those situations, the better results that I had. And as I reviewed those photographs more and more critically, I was not only delighted by what they yielded, but also confronting the limitations. How could they be better? <laughs> And I quickly came up against the, the barrier of the aircraft itself because in most cases I was shooting through plexiglass through the window and I was going much faster than I would have wanted to go. And I couldn't be as low as I wanted to for the subjects. And so after a few years of working around those obstacles, I finally came to the conclusion that I needed my own airplane and it needed to be chosen specifically for these, uh, these mission requirements. And that's when I decided to build an aircraft. And 
once I started down that path, I was, uh, I was committed. That was a, a serious undertaking because I basically built an entire flying machine whose sole purpose in life was to, to take me up for photographs. And it was then a period of uh, learning because there is no place you can go to school for learning to be an aerial photographer, uh, especially if you're the pilot. And that was my case. I looked at being a pilot as an advantage because I could take myself where and when and how I wanted to be for the photographer self. <laughs> and it was um, an extremely rewarding relationship of fine tuning the flying to the requirements of the image making. And so from the very start, it was pretty much a seamless integration between the two tasks. And I have come to feel that they're inseparable now. I'm not very happy when I have to make a photograph from the air if someone else is flying. And it's just because there's an extra step of, of communication involved there. And so often, I think any pilot who takes pictures from the air, an airplane would understand this. So often you don't know quite where you wanna be and exactly how high you wanna be for an image until you're there and you're guided there by your intuition. And as a pilot, you're capable of, you know, carrying out that intuition precisely without having to translate it into language or instructions. And so um, after a few years of learning as much as I could just by, you know, trial and error and experimenting with different strategies, uh, I felt like I had honed the process very well to where my limitations now were not so much technical, but more just in the realm of my own imagination. And of course, that's where an artist wants to be. The tools are already there, they're in place, you know how to use them, and now it's time to, to tap the deep well. And uh, that characterized that later stage of my career, and I began to submit images for review at various publications and take workshops and just begin the process of getting my work out into the world and uh, that um, produced a number of uh, results that kind of catapulted me into another level of, of recognition and therefore opportunity and so it just kind of snowballed on from that point but the key thing is that I remember at that stage of my life which was let's see I was um, 31 years old when I decided to build my own airplane for aerial photography. I remember that sense of commitment. It was not unlike um, the sense of getting married. Like, this is the person, this is the thing that I want to commit my life to. <laughs> and uh, I did. I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have any other obligations than my professional flying. And uh, I lived at the airport I had access to uh, this hangar, in fact, for building my aircraft, and it just uh, integrated with my life so perfectly that uh, a year and a half later, I had my own flying machine, and it was, it was a dream come through, true to have my own access to the sky where and when I wanted. And I might mention as cheaply as possible, because I was a working person, and uh, flying is inherently an expensive thing to do and when you're using it primarily for creative purposes it seems a little daunting to to think about uh, the kind of freedom that you would crave as a photographer to have that in the air but that's what my little home-built flying machine gave to me and so the uh, the process of exploration the exploration of the landscape the le exploration of the photographic process and the creative process was just, uh, it was a highlight of my life. That was really a, a prime time. So people wonder why I tend to focus on archeological sites in my aerial photography. And um, the truth is that, yes, I do focus on archeological sites, but not to the exclusion of other subject matter. And, and the truth is that the, the majority of my archive of photography still is uh, non-archaeological. So 
that indicates several things. One is that I have an enormous body of work. <laughs> and it also indicates that um, my first love in doing this work was the, the landscape itself, the, primarily the natural landscape. And that kicked into high gear when I moved to the Four Corners from Pennsylvania, where I had lived up to that point. And as I began flying here in the Four Corners uh, with Window Rock as my point of origin, uh, it revealed itself as a world-class landscape. The, the topography, the, uh, the weather, um, the seasonal changes were just all so spectacular. And as an artist, they were just so engaging to me that um, that was what I worked on for a number of years, almost exclusively. And the way I found my subjects was in my professional flying, because every day it was my job to get in an airplane and head out across the landscape in one of the compass directions. And I became familiar with a lot of the, the uh, landscape that is not near roads. And it never ceases to amaze me just how much land is out there that most people just don't know even exists unless you look at a map or Google Earth or something like that. But to see it for yourself firsthand from above, you realize uh, what a treasure there is out there that is completely invisible from the highways, which is our usual you know, means of access. And so I accumulated a whole variety of locations in my professional flying that I would mark on my charts, make note of in my mind, or take snap record shots with my camera out the window, knowing that someday I will come back here. And I will come back here in my own airplane with all of my camera equipment at just the perfect time of day in the right flying conditions. And it will be all about photographing the, the beauty of this particular location. And I had uh, accrued a, a very long list of such places in my years of flying here from Window Rock before I actually had my own airplane. And so there were years after I built my plane where all I was doing was going back and working this list. And of course the list kept growing even as I was working it. But in the course of all of that, I became more aware of the human landscape as well. And kind of, it's almost as if the, um, you know, the glare of the beauty of the natural landscape began to subside just enough that I could begin to see what else was there. Um, what else is interesting and fascinating about this landscape than just the sheer geological drama? And of course, that's when uh, ruins came onto my radar. And I had uh, some friends who were archaeologists, and they helped uh, grow my awareness. And I did travels and explorations on the ground, just like everybody else who lives out here. And that all fed my overall awareness of what I was seeing from the sky as well. And I realized that it was a dimension of the landscape that the more I paid attention to it, the more uh, rewarding it was to me because I understood the significance of what I was seeing and how special these places were because they were so unlike anything else that was out there. And they were older than anything else that you could see that was human made. And they were still remarkably well preserved in many cases. And it also was uh, quite rewarding to learn how to uh, detect them because they don't like some of the major ruins in Chaco Canyon that are still standing three and four stories tall and imposing no matter what standard you apply to them. There are also many other locations that are quite significant and quite beautiful, but you kind of have to learn how to see them because they don't jump out at you. And learning to see them and to understand how they fit in with the larger spread of history and uh, all the archaeological knowledge that had has been accumulated was really, it became kind of a game, a very rewarding game. And um, at, at, certain, at a certain point along the way, I joined forces with Archaeology Southwest. 
and um, it was a, a very fortuitous uh, juncture because they were able to help inform my efforts by their vast knowledge of the landscape and of significant places, places that were possibly um, under threat from development or whatever. And they were in a position to benefit from the uh, appeal of my low altitude, low angle aerial photographs, often very beautiful because of the way that I work, uh, to show the general public, who is their audience, um, the true beauty of these places and their setting in the landscape, the fact that they're still there and that they're sometimes in danger of going away if we don't take steps to protect them. And so we ended up collaborating in many ways on many different projects um, to, the, to the great benefit of, of both myself and the organization. Do I only work in the Southwest or do I work outside of the American Southwest? And the, the answer is that I mostly work in the American Southwest and uh, have done a little bit of work outside of that. I don't have any burning desire to go too far afield these days. I, I have worked in uh, northern Mexico and uh, out farther towards the west coast. I've done some work in the Midwest uh, and I also did uh, an assignment in Hawaii and the Hawaiian Islands uh, for National Geographic magazine. So. I have been far afield with, with my airplanes, but um, the truth is, uh, as my um, experience deepens and my understanding of why I do this at all deepens, I realize that I am quite content to work here in the American Southwest. And, and it's because I, I love this landscape. I love everything about it, the weather, the geology the remoteness, how uh, little populated it is, the presence of native peoples, uh, both prehistorically and also in a contemporary way. Um, I feel as though I could easily work multiple lifetimes here and still not exhaust the inspiration that I feel from it. So why go anywhere else? <laughs> the list of what I'd like to do here just never ends. My role in this exhibition, um, Oblique Views, was uh, again uh, a result of the collaboration between Archaeology Southwest and uh, myself. And it happened on the back of another project that we were working on together called From Above, um, Images of a Storied Land. It was a museum exhibition that opened in May of 2004 at the Albuquerque Museum. And in the course of doing the research for that, um, and that exhibition consisted of my aerial photographs of uh, archeological sites of all types from around the American Southwest and Northern Mexico. Uh, Archeology span Southwest became aware of the Lindbergh photographs that were made in 1929 in this area. And it was their idea to find those, examine them, and then to uh, re-photograph the best of the lot. And early on when they suggested this to me, um, it, it definitely caught my imagination. And since we you know, had a long history of working together, it was logical for them to ask me if I would try some, uh, some test shots to see if it would be possible and what sort of results it might produce. And so uh, I did. Um, we got uh, some photographs of the Lindberghs from Chaco Canyon, and that was a place that was relatively easy for me to get to and to photograph um, at that time. And so I did uh, a few tests, and we were both uh, uh, very delighted with the results that we saw and realized that there would be some promise here. And there are, there are certain challenges inherent in doing any kind of re-photography from the air, and it's obvious what they are. I mean, you can't find the exact spot on the ground that a photograph was taken from 100 years ago or whatever. Um, 
and yet I was willing to uh, engage the, the challenges, and I had the tools and skills to do it with such a slow-flying, low-flying aircraft that was so maneuverable. I was able to spend the time necessary to find the you know, theoretical point in space from which um, an old photograph might have been taken and to, and to duplicate it. And it's, um, it's definitely somewhat of a clumsy process because you're working in three dimensions and there's no frame of reference um, to tell you precisely where you are other than a number on an instrument panel. And we don't have those numbers from the Lindbergh, so we, we don't know <laughs> where that spot was. So it, it just was a matter of photographing and then re-photographing and then re-photographing until all the parameters of matching got closer and closer and closer. And, you know, a lot of it just boils down to being able to fly slowly enough to have the time to do that as precisely as possible and to not spend a fortune while doing it. And I was able to, to bring that to the project. How does it feel to follow the Lindberghs in documenting these places? It's a difficult thing to, to put into words because it is so uh, experiential. Because flying itself is, in essence, experiential. And when you do it, you engage in an activity that is not normal for human beings to do. And while you're doing it, you're aware of that. There's a certain sense of risk and danger and um, that you don't belong here. <laughs> uh, and so to retrace the invisible steps of someone who did that many decades previously with much less uh, advantage and convenience as what modern pilots have and to use a photograph to establish that you are in fact at the place that they must have been at the same time of year uh, when they made their photograph there's a there's a certain feeling that comes over me. Uh, it's kind of a, a chill or, or a shiver um, that everything has come into focus and that I am precisely at that place and that moment. And um, I can only imagine what it must have been for them to be in such a remote area of the country, much less infrastructure out here then than there is now in an aircraft that wasn't nearly as reliable as uh, what I use. And uh, the roar of the engine and the open cockpit and the fact that they were so far afield from their home environment and doing something so new. And yet there I am all these decades later, right exactly in that place. Um, it is, it is, uh, it's a jolt and it's truly wonderful to have um, a way for all of that to uh, manifest in an artifact. In other words, I have something to show for the experience. They had something to show for the experience. And we can put those two things together. And um, without that flying, and I, I've felt this from the beginning, flying and the, the wonder of it all is so much like uh, a dream. When you wake up from it, it seemed so vivid and so real, and yet after it's over, it just dissipates into nothing. And you tell somebody about it, and all they can really do is say, well, if you, if you say so, sure. <laughs> but with a photograph, you can actually show, yes, this is what it looked like. And uh, so to share that in common with the Lindberghs is, is truly uh, wonderful. Photographically, it's a whole different animal because they already found the photograph. And my task is not the imagining. My task is to recreate the, the circumstances and, and the position from which they made it. And the task is to get that as precise as possible. And the success is simply evidenced in the photograph itself as to how close the match is. Whereas for them, all they needed to do was see it, or find it, let's say, 
see it, I'm talking about a ruin, for example, and get the camera out and successfully make the photograph. And they could come home with that one shot and say, this is it. This is what we did today. And uh, for me, um, I know what that process is like and I enjoy it myself, but it, it's really creatively a whole different enterprise to duplicate someone else's view and to get that just precisely right. Um, but there is something, just as in any body of work, that happens when you have an entire mass, a whole body of work that comes together that's built on that principle. I think there is some true synergy there. In other words, something happens that's greater than the sum of the constituent parts. Um, and that's what makes the exhibition truly something to experience and behold, because all of these multiple elements come together for their cumulative effect on the viewer. And I'm, I'm just delighted to be able to contribute to that process. What do I notice while working with the Lindbergh images? Um, well, to start, I would say that I have really enjoyed working with the Lindbergh images. Uh, it's partly because I enjoy working with images per se, and then to work with aerials and aerial images of such significance and images that I have such a personal um, involvement with, both the, the subject matter, the location, and also the process, um, it's just been uh, a, a multi-dimensional <laughs> delight for me to work with the Lindbergh images, that, that must be said. And I feel as though I can almost inhabit um, their experience as I look at them because I am working with them on my computer monitor at home, the way I work with my own images. And it's a, it's a very large display. And so I'm able to almost enter into that world as if it were an alternate universe. I'm used to doing that with my own images, and to get to do it with these images that are so old and so significant is, is uh, truly wonderful. Um, I also feel that I can inhabit the, the delight and wonder that they must have felt to fly around and locate these places. Uh, you know, simply finding a place <laughs> from the air can really be a journey uh, of its own. And the feeling of success that hits is almost unspeakable. Uh, when you arrive to a general location and you're looking all around and you're saying, it must be here somewhere, and your eyes settle down and you resolve more and more detail, and all of a sudden something jumps out and you realize, oh, ha! look, that's it. And the world just transforms in that instant because you bring now everything that you've carried with you in terms of your knowledge, what you've been told about it, what you've heard about it, to the thing that you're seeing there right in front of you. And you're moving around it in three dimensions and, and beholding it in its, in its suchness as it is there on the landscape. And you got there personally. You navigated to that place in the universe where that only place where it is and uh, so to reach for the camera and take it out and just record that moment is a very natural instinct we you know we call those grab shots where you just grab the camera grab the shot because you're there and it's there and it's amazing and you may not put too much thought into the image itself as to how it's composed and so forth um, and I see a bit of that in their images. Often the horizon is askew. And even if you don't see the horizon, you can tell that the camera is, is canted as it took the photograph. Um, sometimes there are edges or corners of the image that are overexposed or underexposed or they're blurry from, from movement. And all of those are signs of a, let's say, hastily made photograph. And I can just feel the, the vividness of that moment in looking at those qualities of, of their images. Um, there are other times when I feel as if, you know, maybe it wasn't as turbulent and they had the luxury of a little more distance from a subject and, and 
Obviously, one of them was flying and one of them was photographing, so the tasks were divided, and it seemed as if the images were more carefully constructed. And um, I'm especially aware of that because that's one of the goals that I have in my own photography, and it really was the driving force behind uh, going to the great length of building my own aircraft from which to take photographs so that I would have the luxury of an unobstructed view or unobstruct as unobstructed as possible and to be flying as slowly as possible so I had more time and to be able to maneuver the aircraft carefully to produce just the right point in space where every aspect of the image could be carefully considered before I opened the shutter. Um, and so I think of my own, uh, you know, in, in the best cases, my own compositions are what I would call um, carefully constructed. I, I've considered, just like a landscape photographer would on the ground, what's going on in every part of the photograph? Do I want it there or do I want it not? Do I want more of this or do I want less of this? All those things, the luxury is to actually make a conscious choice about those questions rather than just take what you can get in that moment, which was more what the Lindberghs were, were doing. And it's also uh, a delight to feel the raw, um, the raw inherent value of what they were doing. At, from this remove, this point in time, looking back, every image they took is just inherently precious because it's so old and it's from a world that we will never be in again. And, uh, and I love to ponder some of their images where we are not sure of the location that they were made in. Because it, to someone like me who knows this landscape so well, it becomes a bit of a puzzle, almost a challenge, like, hmm, I know that arroyo is out there somewhere. I know that at least the remains of that sheep camp is out there somewhere on the landscape. And if you were there, you could probably see it and you could probably identify it and match it with this image. And so that ambiguity, that invitation is, is very, um, very provocative to me. And, um, and I must admit, I keep my eyes open as I'm flying across the landscape for the, that someday, I might just happen to recognize one of those seemingly anonymous locations in the Lindbergh photographs uh, that I would just happen to stumble upon it. What is my process for taking a contemporary photograph to match uh, a Lindbergh photograph? Um, it is uh, primarily, it begins with studying the image carefully as if I were there in space at that moment. And um, I bring to it awareness of the time of day and the relationship of three-dimensional objects to each other, which is kind of a way of triangulating what the altitude would have been that the photograph was made at. And those are very basic parameters. And of course, the compass direction, What what direction are they looking? Um, these days I have the advantage of going to a source like Google Earth and, and finding the subject, the general location, and it's very easy to determine in a matter of seconds what direction from it they were to produce the, the angle of view that they had. It's a little more challenging to decide what the approximate altitude would have been, and of course the distance. Uh, from the subject. I'm thinking in this case the, the location that I photographed most recently for the project was the Santa Clara Pueblo. And uh, so I very recently went through all these steps of, of studying that image carefully in my studio before I ever left the ground and deciding on roughly what time of day that I would want to be there and uh, what direction from the Pueblo I would need to be and how high I would be. And, and it was Interestingly, in that case, the answers to those questions all were such that it felt like um, a very, very minimal intrusion on the, the world of the Pueblo itself as it is today, which was definitely a concern in, in doing the re-photograph. So in this case, 
basically middle of the day, um, a couple of miles distant from the Pueblo, and pretty high. Uh, I'm thinking offhand, I'm thinking maybe 12 to 1400 feet above the ground, which is pretty high in a small plane. Uh, all of those factors meant that I think that probably no one in the Pueblo at the moment that I was there working would have even noticed me unless they knew I was going to be there and were looking for me because I was so far away and so high and my plane is, is relatively quiet, um, especially when I'm working because I'm flying slowly. Uh, so then the rest happens in the air at the moment that I make the photograph because I have to evaluate uh, the images as I make them as to how close of a match they are and so lately I've been working with the Lindbergh photographs uh, just printed out as simple black and white copies on a letter size sheet eight and a half by eleven and I have them in a in a uh, binder in sheet protectors and I can just leaf through the binder to the different images that I'm rephotographing, and I have that propped in the cockpit so that I can constantly be looking back at it and as I get deeper and deeper into the process of rephotographing, I'm finding that I uh, I kind of decipher their image into uh, more and more nitty-gritty elements of geometry like I'm looking at the shape of a of a bridge or the relationship of one building to another how much of the roof can I see and are the two edges these walls of two separate buildings are they touching or are they almost touching and how much displacement is there between them I'm just my eye all goes almost automatically it's not even a conscious cognitive process anymore to find those uh, core elements that let me determine where I need to be to duplicate those just so. And what I find is, um, again, it's an iterative process. And by that, I mean I do it over and over and over again, hopefully getting a little better, a little more accurate with each iteration until I feel like I've come about as close as I can get. Because the truth is, I can't stop the plane and set up a tripod in the sky. It's just not possible yet. <laughs> so given that limitation, you know, I have reduce the variability to the minimal amount that's possible while you're still in a moving aircraft. And, uh, and so what happens is that I have this location in space that I fly to um, that I've kind of identified for myself by altitude. So I am watching the altimeter because I've learned uh, 7840 7, 7, is too high. 7750 is too low. It's got to be somewhere in between there. So there's that. And then there's also the distance. And I'm really looking down now for landmarks. Like, oh, okay, I see there's a corral, sheep corral down there. I need to I need to be about right here in relation to that sheep corral. And that'll produce the distance from the Pueblo that I need to be to get it to all line up. And I'm just grabbing almost, you know, in the moment, these different parameters that are available to me to kind of hone in tighter and tighter on that location and moment where the image seems to be most successful. And then I have that opportunity and then it's gone. I'm out of it. It's just, even though I'm only going 40 miles an hour or so, it still passes in a matter of seconds. And then as I slowly make a loop around, and as I'm doing that, I'm looking at the screen on my uh, camera and I'm zooming in on those key details of the image that I've already isolated from looking at the Lindbergh image very carefully and quickly judging back and forth, assessing how close did I get and do I need to make some corrections here as I come around. And I, I do that, that routine of, of a series of shots and then orbiting, coming back around, maybe making some corrections for the next pass uh, at least three or four times and often more than that. It just partly depends on how turbulent it is. If it's very windy or turbulent, it's very difficult to have precise control past a certain point of those elements. And sometimes I get lucky and it works out really well right away. Um, other times, like photographing downtown Santa Fe, there are just so many variables that are so evident and that 
everybody's familiar with, various roads and buildings and street configurations, that there's, there's really not a lot of forgiveness in the, in the image. You've got to get it pretty much just right, or it's going to be quite obvious that you didn't. And so um, then at cases like that, I do work uh, harder at it. As you can probably tell, I, I tend to be somewhat contemplative about some of these things, and they're, in a way, they're lifelong questions um, of engagement, and I'm constantly evolving my answers, um, and they're, uh, it's challenging because, and I'll, I'll just start in, you know, what, what draws me to photograph places like Canyon de Chez and and Chaco Ca Canyon, places that I was photographing long before the oblique view projects. Um, and um, it's a complex answer. Um, on one level, it's obvious what draws anyone to these places. Um, the, the spectacular beauty and the uh, significant prehistoric occupation and just the sheer phenomenon of uh, human beings making a, a living in a place such as these are and uh, their, their physical presence in the landscape is just indisputable. They, they, uh, they kind of stop you in your tracks, no matter where you're from and what your background is. And uh, it's, a, it's a delight to see any place of that kind of magnitude from the air, just because it's another way of seeing it. And at the most basic level, the, the inherent intrigue of aerial imagery and aerial experience is just the opportunity to see things in a different way. It's that basic. Um, but beyond that, um, I find too that, um, you know, having lived out here and flown out here for many decades, and because flying professionally, I, I have the opportunity to fly a lot <laughs> and to see these places in just about every imaginable variation of, of time of day, time of night, weather conditions, seasons. Um, I, I realized through that range of experience that there is no one um, identity of these places, that they have, they are as complex and multifaceted in their character as any human being is. And anyone who has lived in an intimate relationship with another human being knows that you never get to the bottom of understanding who that person is. And I feel that way about these locations. I never feel like I get there in terms of really understanding what this is. And part of it is just the three-dimensional complexity of a canyon system like Canyon de Chez. You can look at it on a topographic map or now on, on Google Earth, but until you actually go out in space and have that freedom to move around into any vantage point that you choose or imagine, uh, you don't fully appreciate just how complicated <laughs> the canyon system is in, uh, in those three dimensions. And when you begin to factor in um, the elements of geology and ecology and all the dimensions of human occupation, uh, contemporary and prehistoric signature of, of human usage of the landscape, from the air, uh, you realize that you basically have uh, an, an in infinite subject in front of you. And you can just go as far and as deep into it as you care to go, and it, it will never be exhausted. And so against you know my better judgment on, on some levels of my personality, I continue to take photographs of these locations, even though the, I know I have you know, drawers full of film and hard drives full of digital images at home already of these same places. And it's because I feel that I, I never have um, exhausted what is truly there to, to see and understand. And, um, and I find that to be a very uh, rewarding process that I never get tired of. And especially about Canyon de Chez and Chaco Canyon is that they are austere, beautiful, dramatic locations just in terms of their geography, but they also have a long, rich history of human occupation. And that is just so fascinating to behold, no matter what your vantage point is, uh, to see how human beings made a living there and to imagine what that would have been like 
and especially in the case of Canyon de Chelly, to see human beings today continuing to do that and how different that looks now than it did 800, 1,000 years ago. And knowing that down there are the homes and field houses and fields of people just like us who have access to some of the same technologies that we do, and yet they still choose to be in such a remote, seemingly difficult location and to, uh, to craft their life out of those basic elements. It's just, it's just a wonder to behold. How did photographing the locations that are currently occupied differ from photographing the ruins that are not occupied. Um, one interesting aspect of that is that those are the ones I did most recently. So prior to doing the re-photographs of Santa Fe, Galisteo, and Santa Clara, I hadn't done locations for the Lindbergh project that were contemporary communities. Um, so in that sense, they're much more recent to me in the pro project. And um, there were a number of things that came to mind. One is just a kind of self-consciousness that uh, everybody down there <laughs> can watch me and see what I'm doing. There's a wonderful luxury uh, as an aerial photographer in photographing remote locations like many of these ruins because uh, I know that there is virtually no living human being down there and I, I feel as though I have the place to myself and so there's just that dimension. Um, another is that um, all of the uh, all of the handles as it were that will allow people to compare uh, the re-photograph to the original Lindbergh photograph are much more uh, vivid and familiar and plentiful at these contemporary communities. And so there's going to be much more um, identification from the viewer with what's in, in the photograph, and especially so, of course, for the people who, who live there. Um, and there's a richness in that that's delightful. I found that part of it, it, it really felt alive. Uh, you know, anybody can go out and take a, a photograph, for example, of uh, the city of Santa Fe from the air. But to do one that is precisely to match and one that is over 80 years old, that is something uh, truly special. So there's, a, there's an opportunity that makes what would otherwise be a rather ordinary photograph into something very special that comes through uh, in this project. And another aspect is that there is more of a sense of documenting history, that just as the Lindbergh images were a moment in time that has long since passed, I have the understanding that the photograph that I make today will someday also be just a moment in time that will have long since passed. And to that sense of, of creating a, a, an artifact from this time and this place uh, feels like a very small contribution uh, to make uh, in history. And it's definitely established by the fact that the Lindberghs did it so many years ago, and I'm just following you know, in, in suit. It, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I built my airplane um, in this exact space, right over there in that corner, <laughs> about 25 to 24 years ago. And at that time, all I felt was potential. It was all in the future at that time. And yes, I had flown a lot out here professionally, and I had, like I said, a long list of places accumulated that I was eager to get to and begin working. And it's kind of mind-boggling to realize that I've, I've done all that and so much more, even more than I could have imagined at that time, to the extent that the, the real answer to that question is, you know, I have pretty much photographed everything out here that I have wanted to. There, there is a, a list I have of, it's not written down, it's, in, it's just in my mind, of Chacoan features that I have learned about as the years have gone by um, that I have been photographing steadily down through the years. 
and uh, I realize even now that I almost certainly have the, the largest archive of aerial imagery of Chaco and features that exists, and yet I haven't seen or photographed all of them. And, you know, the longer that list gets of places that I have seen and have photographed, the more I feel the appetite to continue working the list on out to completion. And um, so there are certain places, certain ruins that I have uh, yet to photograph. And I'm not sure how meaningful they would be to anyone else except maybe a Chacoan archeologist. <laughs> but by the same token, I have in the process of doing all of this, discovered a few places that haven't been recorded. And there's nothing that compares with the excitement of that. And it contributes not only just that sense of adding to the wealth of knowledge and understanding that we have about a world that is long past, but also it changes my sense of the landscape that I live and work in, in much the same way I would suggest as being out and coming upon a wild animal. And I'm thinking specifically of a, a mountain lion, which I have done. And when, when I am out and in a place and I'm alone and I'm not armed and I don't have dogs, I don't have any means of protecting myself, and I hear the cry of a mountain lion, and then I find it, I see it, it changes the way I feel about the landscape to know that there's a, there's a major predator out there who could have me for dinner. And the world out there no longer seems quite so innocent and benign as it did before I knew that was there. And it's the same way with finding a new archeological site. Even in the case of uh, last summer, a major Chaco and Great House with roads and associated earthworks and all that. Not that I discovered it, but this archeologist who did discover it hadn't told anyone else about it except a close archeologist friend. And this was a moment of resonance with the Lindbergh experience because that friend of the discovering archeologist knew that I was in the area working on a project with my airplane and he eagerly, excitedly, um, in this case, emailed me to let me know about this location and I might want to consider photographing it while I'm in the area. And I couldn't help but think of Kidder and John Merriam and the Lindberghs and, well, while you're there, <laughs> we have all of these places that you should go check out. And it's, it's just such a, an interesting thing all these years later that that thing is still happening, that archeologists are still finding these places and they're still yearning for more information about what's there. And the best way to get that is to photograph it from the air. And hey, while you're in the area with your airplane, could you do this? And you betcha, <laughs> I'm there. And you know, uh, I made a series of wonderful images of this Chaco and location that is about 100, and, 100 plus miles from Chaco Canyon. And I haven't shown them to anybody. They have just simply been created and carefully set aside. Their day will come, I'm sure. They're not something that I want to advertise uh, or publicize, but there's just that sense that I'm sure the Lindberghs had of contributing to an effort that's much larger than any one person to keep building this understanding, this knowledge base of something that is just steadily disintegrating away in our very midst. You know, when I first saw the, the larger collection of Lindbergh aerial photographs at the Palace of the Governors, um, I realized, I think, as, as we all did, that purely as photographic images, they weren't generally anything special. Um, but that paled, you know, immediately uh, in the face of why they were special, which was that they are so old 
and they're of, in many cases, uh, significant places that keep changing through time. So in other words, they're very important historical documents, and they didn't need to be great photographic images per se to be something very special and important. And, um, and in that sense, it was a wonderful and unique opportunity for me to enter into that body of work as a participant and a uh, contributor. And it was something unlike anything I had done before, because normally I expect my images to have to stand on their own merits individually. Whereas in this case, uh, I was standing on very tall, broad shoulders and simply adding one more uh, piece of information to the story. And uh, I found that very, uh, very rewarding and very, very challenging. Um, and I, it, it brings up the issue of audience, that um, any photographic effort depends to some degree on the audience that it has for its, uh, its ultimate you know, true value. And so this is a very special opportunity to have um, a body of work that's so old, of such old and important places, and uh, to offer something new that, that enhances it, um, and to have the audience pretty much ready-made and just already sitting on the edge of their seats to see what is it going to be, what does the modern version of this image look like, and that was my role to uh, create and, and supply that to the project. And, and it reminds me that in many ways, um, no photograph really uh, has much of a life until it's responded to by a viewer. And, and in this case, you know, how wonderful to have so many people ready to look at these images and that together, you know, individually, the Lindbergh image or my image may not be anything special as photographic images, but together, um, and especially in some, in whole, they become something quite exceptional to experience that all together and to have that to offer to the general public and, and to contribute to the, the flow of history has been uh, a truly unique and wonderful opportunity in, in my career.